this place today.
somebody give God some thanks. I said no weapon formed against us shall prosper. How many of you believe those words?
that somebody from the audience helping me praise God right now. He's worthy. I said he's worthy. just get to have a shout out every time. We don't always have opportunities where the Holy Ghost might just take over or we might start rolling on the ground like good old-fashioned holy rollers. Somebody might fall over in the Holy Ghost. Somebody lift your hands right now. Oh, offer up your praise and worship. He's still worthy. He's still worthy. Oh, we love you, God. We thank you, Lord. We magnify your wonderful name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, no matter what the weapon is, listen to that lyric. No matter what the weapon is. Oh, a down economy. No matter what the weapon is. Sickness on a global scale. No matter what the weapon is. But I lost my job. No matter what the weapon is. I want you to know that I win. No matter what the weapon is, I want you to know how we
Oh, oh, give me that, give me that run. Dun, 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 dun. Let me have it. No matter what the weapon is, I want you to know that I win. No matter what the weapon is, I want you to know that I win. Why don't you turn to your neighbor, lay hands on him, pray the victory over him. In the name of Jesus, I win. I win. Ghost 
shit's running loose. Hallelujah. I worship you, Jesus. I praise your wonderful name. There's victory in the house. There's deliverance in the house. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, I love you, Jesus. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we love you. We honor you. We thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes. Thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen and amen. You feel the victory now? You feel the Holy Ghost? This is what Pentecost is all about. This is why we live for God. Hallelujah. I do have some announcements today. And I've played my fingers numb and I've shattered my voice dry. But that's the best way to do it. I can't think of a better way to start the announcements. You may be seated for just a moment. If you've got your offering and you're ready to bring it, we want you to at this time. If you've already done it, enjoy your comfortable chair over there. Looks nice. Welcome to the church of the sopping wet hanky. We're so glad you could join us today. Welcome to the Pentecostal church, everybody that's online and here in person. Let's give our guests, our friends, our family members a hand. We're so glad you could be with us. I have a few important announcements today that I need to bring to your attention. The first is this. Starting in the month of September, the first Sunday of September, which I believe is September 6th, we are going to be starting a month-long revival with Brother Tyler Sullivan. That's right. Let's get some woos out there. Yeah! He's been here before. He's a, he's a friend of this church. He's a good preacher, a great man of God. And we want him to come and bless us. But you know the most important part of having an evangelist come is paying the evangelist. As we learned, well, it's not the most important part, but it is an essential thing. We need to do it. <laughs> we took care of Brother Sanders for 17 weeks. And we had an, a, a tremendous move of the Holy Ghost all 17 weeks. And we're believing that when Brother Sullivan comes, he's also going to bring an anointing and a powerful spirit with him. So we want to take care of him just like we took care of Brother Sanders and his family. Amen. Pastor is asking us to make a commitment every week, 10 to $20, as much as you're able. 20 preferably. We want to be able to take good care of our evangelists. You know the reason our church gets such good preachers? Is because we take such good care of them. <laughs> and we want to keep that reputation up. So we are asking you to please commit in the coming weeks to taking care of Brother Sullivan when he's here. $20 per person, not per family, because there are some families that have more earners. So let's do $20 per person. Young people, you can squeeze out five bucks here and there. I have a lawn that gets mowed, and I pay young people to do it. So if you have... Any questions and curiosities there, I'll help you pay for the evangelist. So please make that commitment with us. The next announcement that we have this afternoon is our prayer room. It is open. It is waiting for you. And there is an awesome spirit already there. Amen. So we are asking that over the next several weeks, you would please come to the prayer room. Make a conscious effort every 
week to come. We want you to come to the prayer room every week, not just on Sunday and Wednesday. Come on a Tuesday. Drop in on a Saturday. Visit maybe on a Monday. We want you to come to the prayer room. We want it to be filled with our prayers and our worship. We want it to be a place where when we gather together, the Holy Ghost just falls. So we're asking you to please commit to coming every week for the rest of your life, if you would, to the prayer room. Now, those are our announcements today. We're going to go ahead and continue on with our service. Thank you again to all those who made it out to the Pentecostal Church. We're so glad to see you. God bless you and worship with us. I still believe it. You are working. 
believe that today? He is working all things for our good. Amen. I love the power of God that is in this place today. I absolutely love this. This is the best thing I do in my life is give him praise, give him glory, give him honor. Amen. You may be seated if you can. You guys all know it, so you can join in and be part of the choir today. Yeah. Well, 
Oh, now just wait a minute. Just wait a minute. During practice today, our good sound man told one of our singers, said, do you have a testimony? And they said, yes. He said, then act like you're trying to get it through the back wall. There's somebody behind that wall that needs to hear your testimony. So sing like you're going to. I thought that was really good. Amen. So I'm asking you, do you have a testimony? Okay, act like the world is standing outside this wall right here. Let me hear you say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let me hear you say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let me hear you say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let the world hear you say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let them hear you say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let them hear you say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let them hear you say I am blessed. I am blessed. Let them hear you say I am blessed. I am blessed. be seated. Is, uh, uh, what's your granddaughter's name? Natalia. Natalia. Where's Natalia? Is Natalia here? Wave at me, Natalia. Wave at me. Wave at Brother Hurst. Hey, you know what Natalia said the other day? <laughs> this is great. The best thing I heard all week. Uh, I was sick a lot last last week. So Nathan, Brother Nathan called me. I tell him a story. And he said, uh, Natalia was eating a piece of cheese. And she said, I need a pickle. And Nathan or Santa said, why do you need a pickle? He said, she said, because Brother Hurst said cheese and pickle. Is that right? So they got her a pickle. They got her a pickle. And she said, you need to take a picture of this and send it to pastor. <laughs> did, they, did you take a picture? I want it. You sent it to me. I, did I get it? I, 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 we need to send it again. Is that the cutest thing you ever heard in your life? She remembered my cheese and pickle analogy. Outside. I couldn't even preach that day because of the planes, but Natalia remembered my cheese and pickle sermon. Now, today, ladies and gentlemen, it's a prime rib special. With loaded baked potato. That means butter, sour cream, real bacon bits, chives, and cheese. And a little A1 sauce. Don't knock it till you try it. It's like the Holy Ghost. I've been waiting to preach this for a month and a half. Now I want us to pray. I want you to pray that you can receive what I'm going to preach today. 
that you will receive it in the spirit that I preach it. That you will receive it and ask God to give you the spirit of Abraham. Brother uh, Chuck, what is the spirit of Abraham? You wrote it in a letter. Immediate, um, um, immediate obedience. Everybody say the spirit of Abraham. Was the spirit of immediate obedience. And he was called the friend of God. Hallelujah. Let me receive the word of God. Stand to your feet and pray that prayer right now. Let me receive the word of God today. Oh. Come on, everybody, enter into this. Enter into this. I want to receive the Word of God today. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now I want you to hear me when I say before I preach this. I want you to hear me say it. This message can and will change your life. This message comes from the Lord. This message is a word, specific word to this church at this time. I will tell you that this year God has spoke to me a few times. I have walked more by faith this year than out of any other year that I can remember. And I have had but a few words from the Lord, and this is one of them. I, pre I hope that you will appreciate it like I have appreciated. Raise your hands and pray again. Lord, let the spirit that's on the pastor get on me right now. Let my heart be wide open, Lord. Let me receive the word of God. Oh. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, In the name of the Lord, Luke, I'm reading today my text from the book of Luke chapter 7. I will be preaching from verses 1 through 10. Also, this is mentioned in Matthew chapter 8. Our text today is found in verse 7. And verse 8, Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. 
When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. I take my text from verse 8, for I also am a man set under authority. I want to preach today on this subject, a man under authority, a man, a woman, a young person, I'm using that word man as in mankind, a man under authority. You may be seated. What attracts us to this text is because of the words of Jesus that are spoken here that are not spoken in any other place. These words of Christ are rare words. These words of Christ are heavy in compliment. The Lord was a kind Lord, and He often found things to compliment people about. But what the Lord recognized first and foremost in people was their faith. The Lord always took time to point out people's faith and how they were healed, they were delivered because of their faith in God. But this time, this compliment is unique in that he says this is the greatest faith that i found. And I have not found this kind of faith. He specifically delineates, I have not found this kind of faith in all of Israel. Now that should pique our attention. Why is the Lord so emphatic in saying, number one, this is the greatest faith that I found. That bears an examination. The second thing is for the Lord to say, I haven't found this in all of Israel. That bears ferreting out. Now go back to verse 1 in our text. There's several things about this man. He is a centurion. And uh, he is a Roman centurion. In our uh, military authoritative ladder of command, the closest that a centurion would be would be like a captain. Like a captain. The centurion was akin to the captain in the United States Army. He commanded around between 80 and 100 men. In the height of World War II, one of our captains would 
command up to 200 men. These are commanders, centurion. There was several, I think, five more levels of command structure up to uh, the leader of the legion. And then on up the ladder to the senate until it finally reaches the commander-in-chief, which would be the emperor of Rome. Of course, our ladder of command goes up uh, until the commander-in-chief of our armed forces. But the centurion, like the captain, is a front-line commander. You have to understand... The higher you go up the chain of command, the more distant you are from the battle. You oversee the battle, you plan the battle, you prepare the battle, you get materials to fight the battle, but you don't actually see frontline action. The centurion is a frontline commander. He leads the charge. Very valiant. Very brave. If he succeeds in being a captain, he may be promoted later on to a major, to a colonel, to a general, and so on. This centurion is a warrior. But look at him. The scripture says that when the centurion made it known that he would like Jesus to heal his servant. He had Jews advocating for him. Now that is unique. This front line commander, that means he had fought in fights and he was in Israel, so he had fought in fights in Israel. Yet, when he asked about Jesus coming to pray for a servant of his, who was sick unto death. The Bible says that when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying, He is worthy. Now, that is not referring to the servant. That is referring to the centurion. Do you see this? This is very, very rare. That a fighting man who had fought, if not against them, their kinsmen, their countrymen, the centurion had Jews, the elder of the Jews, saying, Lord, we want you to go and heal this man's servant, for he is very worthy of this. And then they went on and they said, He is loved by our country, and he hath built us a synagogue. Now, I don't think I've ever read of any other Roman centurion that took of his salary or of his spoils and turned around and built a synagogue for the people that he was occupying. Is anybody listening to me? So this is unique. This is... This is different from any other 
circumstance. It involves somebody who's not in Israel. He is not a Jew. He is a Gentile. And the Lord is saying about him, he has displayed faith that is of the highest level and I've never seen it in Israel. There has to be a reason for that. Then, here's another little indication of the character of this centurion. He hears that Jesus is coming. And he sends word to Jesus. Specifically now, now that he knows that Jesus has been contacted on his behalf, he sends a direct message to the Lord. I am not worthy for you to come to my house. He says to the Lord that he should not trouble thyself. This is in verse 6. Verse 6 of Luke. For I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, Neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. So the Lord, he is wanting the Lord to understand. I did not, I did not pompously send a message to you to say, come here and heal my servant. What he's saying is, I didn't send this message directly to you because I don't feel worthy. Think about this. This man had a grasp of Christ like few did. He recognized in the Lord authority from another world. He did not see the armies behind the Lord, but he sensed by faith that this man was of the highest order of power. And he said, I am not worthy to send you a direct message. There's a rule in military. You never bypass the authority over you. You take your request to the immediate authority over you. If you're a private, you speak to the corporal. If you're a corporal, you speak to the sergeant. If you're a sergeant, you speak to the first sergeant. If you're a lieutenant, you speak to the captain. If you're a captain, you speak to the major. If you're a major, you speak to the lieutenant colonel. If you're a lieutenant colonel, you speak to the full colonel. If you are a colonel, you speak to a one-star general. No captain, no lieutenant speaks to the general. You speak to the authority over you. What this captain was saying, my God, what this centurion was saying, I don't even have access to you directly because you are so far up the chain of command. I am not worthy 
to ask you directly. And I am not worthy for you to come to my house. Huh. What an attitude. What a very important attitude. Oh, God, forgive us for our arrogance. The way we talk to God. The way we sometimes are so casual to mention his name in profane ways, in common ways. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is of the utmost authority. I'm going to preach a little outside thing here. I feel this. What Brother Hurst, the Lord says, come boldly before the throne of grace. It does. Ask your Father which is in heaven. Abba, Father, you can be intimate with God. That's what makes God so special. He is the Lord of lords, yet He invites us into His personal presence. He, want you, he wants you to bring your needs before his throne. That's the kind of God I'm serving. But here's what I'm trying to say. We take advantage of that. We become sloppy in his presence. We become casual. We should show thanksgiving. We don't show enough thanksgiving. Some of you haven't thanked the Lord in months. All you've done is complain. All you've done is cry. All you've done is whine. All you've done is ask why this and why that. You ought to show thanksgiving unto the Lord. You ought to say, Lord, if you never bless me again, you bless me enough already. If you never heal my body again, you've touched me so many times already. You are my King of kings. You are my Lord of lords. You are my highest, utmost authority. And I want to pay respect. And I want to pay homage. And I want to worship you. Somebody throw your hands up and spend the time. Worshiping the Lord, for the Lord is good. The Lord is good. Uh, uh, I'm not worthy of the Lord. Never on my best day. Am I good enough for the Lord? And I have a lot of days where I'm not on my best day. Can I get an amen? But he loves us nevertheless. Somebody was preaching on Esther a while ago, and they mentioned that when Esther invited the king, even though the king was her husband, she put on her royal apparel. She put on, she had been fasting and praying for three days. She did not have the answer to her prayer, but she took time to dress up in her best, wash her face, comb her hair, square her shoulders, and present her best for the king. And they said, I believe it was Brother Emery, right? She wouldn't ask the king for anything. She just lavished on him love, lavished on him respect, lavished on him his just desert. 
and she waited. Oh, man, I'm preaching ours. I'm preaching myself under conviction. She waited, didn't he say, not the first day, but the second day. She waited until the king said, what do you want? How impatient we are with the Lord of Lords. How disrespectful at times we are with the King of Kings. We march in and just start telling him our laundry list, giving him our grocery list like he is some stock boy in our life. He's not your stock boy. He's your king. He's your master. The Bible said, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his holy name. I think we all ought to clap our hands. I think we all ought to take a minute and say, thank you, Jesus. You are so worthy of our praise Regardless of what I'm going through. There's a passage of scripture in the book of Esther. And it says, I know this is not in my sermon, but I really feel like I need to say this. It says of Esther's uncle Mordecai. Mordecai knew about the plot. You know what I'm talking about. And he put on sackcloth and ashes. And he went through all the city moaning and groaning. He wanted people to know that there's a very bad thing fixing to happen. And we need to get a hold of God. But he couldn't come in before the presence of the king. Because in the text it says, For none might enter in to the presence of the king clothed in sackcloth and ashes. You know what that meant? Don't matter what you're going through. You pay respect. You pay homage. You don't bring your sackcloth and ashes before the king. You put on the royal garment of praise and worship. You dress in your best. I am not worthy. I am not worthy to send you a direct message. I am not worthy for you to come into my house. Oh, I'm reminded of James chapter 4 and verse 6 that says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Somebody preach with me here right now. What a very unique, what a very perceptive man that this captain, that this centurion was. Why did he feel like the Lord? Let's get into this a little bit. Why did he feel like the Lord didn't need to come to his house? Notice, before the Lord is involved with the centurion, in Matthew 8, there's a leper that calls out to the Lord and says, If thou wilt, thou can make me whole. And the Lord says, I will. And the scripture said, and he touched the leper. Now probably in the leper, that touch was more significant than in other healings. 
because he was a leper. Because he hadn't been touched in so long. No one wanted to touch him. But the Lord is willing to touch even the leper. I preach to the backslider today. The Lord will touch you. I preach to the cold and indifferent. The Lord will touch you. I preach to the lonely in heart. The Lord will touch you. And after this bookend, leper before, centurion in the middle, and the Lord goes to Simon Peter's house, and his mother-in-law is sick with a fever. And the Bible says, and he touched her. Most places where the Lord heals or delivers, he touches them. But the centurion says, I don't need you to come to my house. (laughs) I don't need you to touch anybody. He says, Speak the word. He's got a hold on something. He's coming. This centurion is coming from a paradigm not found in Israel. He reveals it in his next statement. He said, for I, is anybody listening to me? I am a man under authority. And when I speak, my soldiers obey. Do you get that? I don't need to touch you. I don't need to convince you I don't need to beg you I just need you to speak the word you think that touched Jesus in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God Just say, (laughs) I get it. Say the word, and it will be obeyed. I don't know who your soldiers are, because I can't see them, but I sense a great heavenly host. And I know what it is to command men and when I speak they go do you know how I know that because when my leader speaks to me I go immediate obedience no counseling well let's sit down and talk about it Abraham Take thy son, thine only son, to the top of the mountain and offer him as a sacrifice unto me. No counsel, no whining, no complaining. Honey, me and the boy are going yonder to the mountain to worship. When you don't understand the command. Treat it as an opportunity to worship. You ought to write that down. When you don't understand the command, treat it as an opportunity to praise God.
I don't think you got that. It's called the sacrifice of praise. The sacrifice of praise is when you don't feel it, but you know he's worthy of it. So you praise him. You dress up in your best garments of praise with your heart breaking, with your heart aching, and you come into his presence with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. There ought to be a praise going up. Let there be a praise. Why did Jesus say, this is the greatest faith I've ever seen, and I've never seen this in Israel? Is, why is the Lord taking a shot at Israel? That's His people. He loves Israel. More than once He said, I'm but sent to the lost sheep of Israel. We all know how the Lord feels about Israel. Even if he knows that there's a deficit in Israel, why would he point out that this is something that Israel can't comprehend? I haven't been able to find. He found faith in Israel. He found people in Israel that had faith in him. Yet he said to this centurion, about the centurion, this man's at another level. This is the greatest level of faith. He don't need a touch. He don't need my presence. Just speak the word. And the reason is, for I am a man who understands authority. Do you know why Israel couldn't get this? Because they had no authority. Israel, at this time and for a long time, had no army. They were under the occup occupying forces of Rome. Rome had the authority. Rome had the legions. Rome had the armies, not Israel. And so the Israelite, the Average Israelite had a very limited concept of authority. But not Roman soldiers. They got it with their mother's milk. They were very aware of the structure of authority. And this, sin, are you listening to me? And this centurion, what he was saying, I understand the power of unity. When you are in this army, it just takes a word. Go. Come. Stay. This is a front line commander. When he says attack, 
It must be immediate obedience. He's not going to just say things to just see if they work. Every word is going to be thought out. Every word is going to have some strategic value. No loose talk on the front lines. When the courier came from headquarters with directions for the field commanders, it was cut and dried. No debate. Oh, that don't go well with our American mentality. We want a democracy on everything that we do. It's getting real quiet in here. We don't really understand this kind of authority, this kind of unity. I heard somebody, I didn't, I didn't see the interview, but there's, a, there's an interview that has taken place and uh, I, I, I don't know exactly who this was, but it's somebody that has studied American history. And he says, if the church in America goes belly up, we will not be able to have a democracy. This is not a religious historian. This is a, this is a secular. And this was his reasoning. He said, when Americans lose their attitude of obedience, we cannot function as a democracy. And he said, the linchpin, this is not me, this is this historian. He said the linchpin of democracy is the voice of the pastor. If they don't obey the pastor, they won't obey anybody. Look at the chaos in our city. They won't listen to anybody. And if you agree, they'll want more and still burn it to the ground. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the church to let itself be known. We're still here. We're still here in America. And we believe in God and country. One of our pastors, his, uh, his parking lot, he has a favorite place in his city for cops to come and take their lunch break and park in his parking lot. And so he's like me and about 3,000 other churches. Drove by the Catholic Church yesterday that is having Saturday Mass inside. It's not just Pentecostals. We're tired of the government telling us what to do. He was going to have an indoor service, and when he did, the policeman that parked in his parking lot came in to the church. And he thought, oh boy, they're going to shut me down. Until they started gesturing to him. I know I'm chasing a little rabbit here, but it's apropos to the time. The chaos 
is only regulated by obedience. And when we lose our obedience, anarchy will reign in our country. Now, I am preaching this. Organized faith. It's what I'm getting to. Why is this faith great faith? Because it involves more than one person and God. There is unity that all you have to do is give the command because I understand unity. When I get a command, I do it. Can you make the switch? If you don't like the word authority, I'm going to make it a little bit easier for you. Let's use the word influence. But I will say, if authority offends you, you're going to stay offended in this church. I am a frontline commander. I'm not a general. I don't have five stars. I'm a frontline commander. Maybe one of these days down the road, I'll hand my command off to another frontline commander and I'll sit behind him. But right now, bless God, I'm not on the sideline. I'm looking the enemy in the eyeball and I'm saying to my church, follow me as I charge Hebrews 13 and 17, I could go here, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourself for they watch for your souls as they must give an account. I could go to Hebrews 13, I could go to Acts 20 and 28, take heed therefore to yourself and to the flock in which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own, own blood. But the, the fact of what I'm trying to get today is not to get you to agree to the principle that I have the right to give command. If I have to convince you that I have the right to give the command, you're not ready to do the command. So I am calling on 16 years of being able to give good Commands that has not cost lives. And if lives were lost, it was in the cause of the greater good. If we did sacrifice, it was worthy of our sacrifice. Do we have all the answers? No. But we do have a word. And I, I am giving you a word. The greatest faith, if you're taking notes, you need to write this down. The greatest faith is unified faith. The greatest faith is organized where two or three agree. This is Matthew 18, 19, and 20. On earth, as touching anything that they ask, it shall be done for them. Of my Father, highest authority, which is in heaven. 
For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. On the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 1, verse 14, these all continued. This is talking about the 120 with one accord. Everybody say one accord. Everybody say unity. Unity in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brethren. Everybody obeyed. Mary is not a God. She obeyed God. Not only is this said in Acts chapter 1, is anybody still listening to me? Verse 14, it's repeated in Acts 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one Place. I could preach from Joshua 23 that talks about Joshua and Moses both tapped into this. Moses in Deuteronomy. 32, Joshua, in chapter 23, they, they caught a glimpse that when they fought under the command of God, one could chase a thousand, two could overcome 10,000, that it was more, it was more than what you could immediately see. That through faith and being connected to the authority of God, one could put a thousand down. Two could chase ten thousand. I've said all that to say this. I need a hundred people. I just need one hundred people. That's the figure God put in my head. Not 50, not 75, not 82, not 150. He said, if you can get 100 people to do this. Sit down. So what are we talking about? I'm talking about a prayer room that I had plans on building one of these days. Not anytime soon, but somewhere down the road, I was going to turn that room, storage room, into a prayer room. I really didn't know when, and I'd made up my mind it ain't going to happen until we sign the papers and it's our building. And then the Holy Ghost spoke to me. Now, folks, there are some things I don't know, but I do know. The word. And I do know when God speaks. Are you with me? He said, Brother Rodney Nelson called and sent an email. He said, I have a storage container that I bought, put on my piece of property, and they are telling me I've got to move it. Storage container, 12, 40 feet long, 
ever, how wide, tall. He said, I will give it to the first pastor that asks. All I'm saying is you've got to pay for it to be moved from my property to your church. And I read it and thought, well, that's nice. And uh, went to the next message. And the Holy Ghost said, stop. Get that container. And I said, see, I'm not Abraham. I don't need it now, God. He said, get the container now. I said, aye. I picked up the phone. I called Brother Nelson. I said, am I the first? He said, yes. I said, I want it. He said, it cost you $600 to have it moved. I said, I'll take care of it and call you back with the details. And in my mind, I'm like, God, I'm about five years early. Church is wore out. We're give out. I'm give out. We're, we just need, you know. And the Lord said, clean the room out. See, that's why I don't feel like pussyfooting with y'all. God don't pussyfoot with me. He don't say, well, Nady Bo, if, if you would find it in your heart, maybe you would. God's never talked to me like that ever. He ain't my mama. He's my God. He speaks. I obey. The quicker I obey, the better he likes it. Some of you are like, I don't know if I should say amen because then you're going to expect us to do it. I'm like those policemen. He said, clean out. We got that, we got that thing. I got $600. Had a guy come out. Fussed with him. He wanted to deliver it over here. He wanted to put it over here. He wanted to do this and that. I said, no. It's got to go right there, and the door's got to be on this side. It's like it's always a deal. Just because it's the will of God doesn't mean you're not going to have to fight about it. This guy was just lazy. He wanted me to get a tractor and move it around the way I want. I said, no, 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 I'm paying you money to deliver it here. Finally, he got the drift. He got out there. He dropped it in the middle of the road. Picked it up, turned it around, backed it in, did it the way I liked it. And I'm looking at it, and the Lord speaks again. He said, clean the room out now. I said, God, we got now. I said, okay. Matt, I say unto my soldier, get the guys out here and clean out that room. And you know what he said? Okay. Yes, sir. And in my mind, I was going, I'm not exactly sure why we're cleaning it out because uh, we ain't going to do nothing, God, for a couple of years. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, I've got plans for that room. So we cleaned it out. Did we clean it out? Did you clean it out? Did you clean it? Yeah. But we is thee. And thee is me. Because we're connected. And there's a chain of command. Oh, I'm losing some of you. Pull up your American pants here. And put on your apostolic pants. 
They both start with A, but they're a whole lot different. This is not a the, this is not a democracy. The church is a theocracy. I'm going over this to show you in a week, in a week, a young family in this church came to me with tears in their eye, said, Brother Hurst, we want to donate $7,000 so that we can build our prayer room now. And I said, wonderful. And I heard the Lord go, hmm. I didn't tell them because they're under my command. God had spoke to them. And so they came to their immediate authority and said, we feel like this is the will of God for us to do. So I knew $7,000 ain't going to get it done. So I took up an offering. Y'all remember that? We got $5,000 more dollars, at least pledged. I don't know if we actually gave it because that's about time COVID hit. And oh, my Lord, when COVID hit, you forgot everything but COVID. I don't know how much of that $5,000 come in, but I knew it was going to take more than $12,000. Everything always costs more and takes longer. But now I had a word from the Lord and I had just enough of a glimpse of what God was intending to do. Is anybody interested in what I'm saying? I'm telling you this because there's a reason. And so we was going to pump the air. We was going to pump the air, you know, and then we was going to have, it would be cool when we're having church at least. You know, it would be cool on Sundays and Wednesdays because we'd turn the air on in here, whether it was heat or uh, air. And Brother Frank is back there, and he's going, Brother Hurst, you know, we can do that. We can pump that air. He said, but we're not going to turn the air on during the week. And it's going to be hot, and it's going to be cold. And I, I was thinking, yeah, it, it is. And we're going to keep that door locked here so nobody can come in here and turn on the air and then go out and come around. That don't make sense. And he said, why don't we just do it right the first time? And I heard, I heard the Spirit of the Lord said, listen to him. He's a businessman. He's right about this. Take the plunge. Do it right now. And I didn't know. I said, well, how much is that going to cost? He said, well, I he said, let me, let me figure it up. $8,000 for the unit, for the installation, all of that. That's 8,000 more than the 12,000 of which some of that 12,000 didn't come in. And I said, oh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I mean, I don't want to give too much away, but I had to finish out the building program, I had put $20,000 on my American Express. Kind of had some overreaches. And my American Express was squeaking. And I was looking at the monthly nut, you know. <laughs> and I was thinking about another 8000 And And uh, <coughs> Frank said, and I'm not just lauding on Frank. There's other men that worked very hard, sacrificed, gave good prices, gave volunteer labor. Brother John. Gary gave us a good price. Wasn't just Brother Frank, but he said, just pay me as you can. And I felt the witness of the Spirit that says, this is the thing to do. Now, all of that's going on. And I go to the prayer room before it's done. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me. He said, 
I want this to be a dedicated place of prayer. I want you to start with 100 people a week committing to praying. He said it needs an outside door where they don't have to traipse through the church because I want them to come directly in and pray and leave. Coming nothing to the church but for to pray. They can work on their Sunday school room later. They can clean the church later. They can do whatever else later. But I want a direct entrance into the prayer room. So I called John. I said, we got to have a direct entrance. So that means we got to have an electronic lock. Is anybody listening to me right now? And the Holy Ghost spoke to me. This is when uh, Victoria was painting the letters on the wall. You was doing the letters, Victoria, free. There's another person that worked hard. And you had left, and I went in there, and the Holy Ghost said, if you will dedicate this as a place of prayer, if you will get my people to unify around this place, listen to me, I will put my presence in this place. I will put my presence, write it down. I will put my presence in this place. I will hear their prayer in this place. I will answer their prayer in this place. I will be a comfort unto them in this place. And I will let this place be a habitation for my angels. And the Lord said, do you remember when I showed you the angels in the sanctuary? And I said, Lord, I will never forget it. We went on vacation. And we come back on 101. And when we was coming through Anderson Grove, I think it's Anderson Grove, massive redwoods. I said to Rhonda, this is what those angels looked like. They was as big as redwood trees. Their head went up through the ceiling. They was the angels of the sanctuary of Landmark Pentecostal Church. And God showed me a second or two, but it affected me for all of my life. And the Lord said, I will let my angels inhabit that place. We're not going to get into angel worship. We're not going to start praising angels. But I am prophesying way more than one or two or three or four. It's going to be in prayer. And God is going to open eyes. And for a moment, you are going to see What I saw 25 years ago. I am a commander. And I am looking for 100 soldiers to obey. I promise you a revival. I promise you a revival. 
I promise you a revival you have never seen. 